Good morning and welcome to the final meeting of the committee who is to decide the best family in the world. As you know, we've been working on this for the last year. We've been creating a shortlist and thinking about families from the beginning of time until now. And we made our shortlist and we have submitted it to some experts. And today we're here to find out what they said and who is going to win this award, the Best Family Ever Award. So we think that they've done really well, the designer, to create this award, something a bit of an Oscar and something of a family. And although we couldn't quite stretch to solid gold, we found a beautiful piece of solid olive wood, which is about life and growing and family trees. And we felt this was really appropriate. So today is the exciting moment when we're going to discover who will receive the Best Family Ever Award. So we're going to review our shortlist and we're going to see what the experts said about the names that we came up with. So if you remember, our first couple was Adam and Eve. We thought they were incredible. I mean, can you imagine staying married for a thousand years? A thousand years without any books, any videos, any marriage retreats, any marriage counselors, one thousand years, wow. That's absolutely incredible and also to survive the tragedy of one son's death, murder, and the other son's murder conviction. That takes something. But you know what? Our reviewers weren't as positive as we were. It says here they had an unfair advantage. They had no in-laws. And even worse, every problem that every family has ever had started with them, the mistakes they made in the Garden of Eden. So all the broken families, all of our mistakes, well, their fault. So we have to cross them off the list, I suppose. The next family we had was Abraham and Sarah. We thought they did a pretty good job. They've been called the mother and father of Israel. And again, our picky team of experts pointed out there's a few problems with this family. Bit of an issue with the whole Hagar episode and Abraham having a child with his wife's maid. Bit dodgy that. Twice Abraham lied and had his wife put at risk by placing her in another man's harem, including one time when she might have been pregnant with Isaac. And then the child protection expert, well, I won't read out what he said, but he pointed out we cannot be seen to condone Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son, however good the reason. So we've had to cross them off the list too. The next family we had was Jacob's family. Again, a great patriarch. Father had at least 12 sons and a daughter, pretty good going. But then our expert witnesses pointed out a few problems with this family. He had at least four wives and we're trying to promote committed monogamy here. And singling out one son for special favors and giving him a fancy coat, never a good parenting strategy. And then the sibling rivalry between those sons are falling. Can you imagine it was so bad they sold their brother to be a slave and then told their dad he was dead? And they pretended that Joseph was dead for years and years and years. Whoa, it's pretty awful, that, isn't it? There is a happy ending, but it's definitely messy along the way. So, all right, we'll cross them off too. Getting a bit thin on the ground here. David, um, yes, well, David, we thought he might do really well. David, a man after God's own heart. Surely he would be a winner, we thought. Let's see what they have to say. Well, again, too many wives. A bit hard to say how many. And then there was the whole Bathsheba affair, having uh, an affair with her and then plotting the death of her husband to cover up the whole mess. And then years later, just look at the children. Between them, there is treason, murder, rivalry, incest. Whoa, no. I'm afraid we have to cross them off the list. We can't reward a family with all that stuff going on, can we? We're running really low now. Is there anybody else? Oh, yes, Mary and Joseph. Of course, they must be really high on the list because God chose them to parent his own son. I mean, they must have been the best family ever. And actually, when you think about it, this award looks a bit like them. But you know what? Our super scrupulous reviewers have even managed to find a problem with this family. They said any parents who managed to lose their 12-year-old son for three days would probably be charged with neglect today, whatever reason the son gave. <sighs> And that's a shame, because I kind of fancied giving them this award. And that's it then. We don't have any other families left on the list. Oh, there's one here. It just must be a last-minute nomination. Let's see who it is. Ooh, 
Bernie and Karen Holford. Never heard of them. Something about Karen working in family ministries at the division? As if that makes any difference. But oh dear. There's a little post-it here at the bottom. It says, this couple is totally unsuitable. You should see how hard Karen bangs the kitchen cupboard doors when she's in a bad mood. Some of the hinges are broken. And once they had such a big row at the dinner table that their 15-year-old son had to remind them that they were grown up studying family therapy and they really ought to know better. And there's much worse. Oh, dear. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Well, I just think I'd better draw a veil over that on Sabbath morning. It's really worrying. I mean, you'd think they would know better, wouldn't you? So that's about it. No one else? Any nominations from the floor? Any family here at Newbold that could be given the best family ever award? And we know there's some best dads ever, so maybe we should think about them. Do I take the silence as a no? Does that mean we had this beautiful award made for, like, for nothing? Hmm. I wonder. Maybe we have just been working with the wrong definition of what makes the best family, a really good family. Maybe in an imperfect world like ours, there are lots of really important things that God wants to teach us through our imperfect families. Things that we cannot learn if we're a perfect person living with perfect people. How would you develop patience? What would forgiveness mean to you if you were perfect and everyone was perfect? What would we not understand about God if we were all perfect? It's interesting, I think as a parent, God taught me so much about him through parenting my children. I have a sense that God taught me more about his love through my parenting than I ever managed to convey to my children as hard as I tried. There is so much I learned from him about being patient, about loving your kids anyway, even when they're totally messed up and poured tomato spaghetti all over their head, their face, and the nice new carpet. And when, you discover, when one of them discovered how much fun it was to throw stones at the greenhouse, because it makes such a nice noise when the glass breaks, we had to learn about forgiveness and restoration and putting things right. And when one of our children needed to be held 24 hours a day for the first few months, I learned how God longs to be with me 24 hours a day. And sometimes I learned that when we make the biggest mess, when our children made the biggest mess, something in me wanted to love them more, wanted to make it better, wanted to mend all that was troubling them in their life. And so through parenting, through the brokenness of relating to other people, we can learn more about God's love. And in my marriage too, I've learned more about God's love in marriage through the Bernie's commitment to me for being how he cherishes me is the way that um, it shows me something of the way that Jesus cherishes his church. Together we've learned what it means to be committed for richer and poorer in sickness and in health till death eventually will us part. And when I bumped into Bernie's car, bumped Bernie's car one day and left a dent in the back, he was able to, with God's help, I believe, accept me wholeheartedly and say, Karen, as long as you're okay, it doesn't matter about the car. Even though he had to drive that car for three more years, and his friends would go, hmm, huh, look what Bernie's done. And there is no bumper sticker that says, my wife did this. So that's true acceptance. He bore my, my mistake on his car for a long time. And so we cried through life's tragedies. We've learned how God comforts us. And we've learned so much in the everyday, nitty-gritty bits of relationship that family bumps us into. And if we don't have family close around us, just relationships with other people at work, here in the church, in our everyday lives, in those moments when our broken bits bump into other people's broken bits and we cause pain that we don't want to cause pain, God can help us. God can help us mend and God can help us grow. And I wonder if we went back to the great patriarchs we talked about earlier, I wonder what they would say they had learned through their broken families. If we go back to Adam and Eve, they really learned about commitment for the long haul. They learned what it would mean to forgive and to comfort each other through the pain of life. What about Abraham and Sarah? I think they, must, they learned about the importance of following God and trusting his will, that God would do what he said even when things look humanly impossible. They learned to trust. They learned to be patient. They learned to stay close to God. And what about Jacob's family? a really messy family. 
they learned lessons about humility. Joseph had to learn humility. They all had to learn that God works through even the chaotic messes that we cause for ourselves. God can work through that and make something beautiful. And they learned the importance of honesty and forgiving each other through a terrible betrayal. What about David? What did he learn? David and the messy, tragic Bathsheba episode. Through that, David learned so much more about God's forgiveness for him. It took his understanding of God's loving forgiveness to a new level, a new dimension that he would never have understood in a perfect world or the perfect relationship. And he can see God's patience. Because even though this relationship did not start in the right place, God blessed it. God said, I'm going to make the best of your mess. Here's Solomon. And Solomon blessed him. God blesses us abundantly even when we mess up and even when we least deserve it. And what about Mary and Joseph? Well, from the very beginning of their relationship, this couple had to learn how to trust God for guidance in their life through really tough times. And when they did lose Jesus just for a little while, they learned the importance of keeping their eyes on him every single day. And they knew, as is for all of our families, that God is present in our home. He was present in their home every single day. He's present in our home. What difference does that make to us? So all of these families, they learned the importance of keeping their relationship with God strong. That's what helped them through. That's what helped them to learn. That's what helped them to grow and mend the brokenness in their relationships. God mending them and then them passing the mending on to others. When God is mending us and we are experiencing his love, his forgiveness, his comfort, his acceptance, when that is really penetrating our hearts, he can inspire us to mend our other relationships with these things. And it's much easier to mend relationships in the everyday rough and tumble of life when we are keeping our relationship with God strong and our relationship with each other. There will be hurts, there will be bumps, there will be cracks, but the more love there is surrounding, then the more mending can take place. Several centuries ago, there was a Chinese emperor who really appreciated a cup of tea. And actually, he appreciated the cup a lot. And one day, he was having his cup of tea, and he dropped the cup, and it broke. And he was really distressed by this. It was his favorite cup. He probably had a thousand cups. But being an emperor, he can have his favorite, and this was obviously it. Maybe it was one his wife gave him on their wedding day, or something that was passed down from his grandmother. But his beautiful teacup broke. So he called his advisors and said to them, I want you to fix my cup. Their hearts sank. They looked at the broken pieces. They knew in China at that time the only way to mend porcelain was with some gray metal alloy that was really ugly. You only used it in really desperate situations. So they did what wise men sometimes do, give the responsibility to somebody else to fix the problem. So they took all the pieces in a box and they went to Japan where they knew they were really creative artisans who could do beautiful things. And they thought, let's just pass the problem to them. So the artisans in Japan opened the box, they saw the pieces and their hearts sank. Because probably their lives might be at risk too if they messed up on this important task. And they got their heads together and said, what can we do? And one of them said, you know what, this cup must be really precious to the emperor. Otherwise, why would he want this fixed? So if it's really precious, how can we make it even more precious? And that's when they had the idea, mending it with an alloy of gold. And they created the art of kintsugi, which is about taking things that are broken, but that have been precious, and saying, it has been precious. It is still precious. We're not just going to throw it away. We're going to take what is precious and mend it in a way that makes it even more precious. And so they sent the cup back, mended with gold, and the emperor was delighted. His favorite teacup looked even more beautiful, and it was actually even more precious. And this is what God does for us. God is probably the original and most perfect kintsugi artist there has ever been. Because whenever we are broken, he wants us to come to him with our broken pieces because we are precious to him, all of us. He says, bring me your brokenness. Let me mend it. Let me mend it with the kintsugi of my love 
which is an alloy of many aspects of his love. And how does he mend us? Well, one of the um, ingredients in the alloy is acceptance. First of all, when we are broken and we go to him with all of our brokenness, the first thing he lets us know is we are accepted, even in our brokenness, that nothing will come between him and his acceptance of us because we are precious to him. And he mends us with his total acceptance, even when we've made a right mess of our lives. If we go back to the Bible and think of Zacchaeus, the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, their lives were broken. They felt hopeless. But Jesus said, you know what? I accept you anyway. And in that moment of acceptance, feeling the acceptance of Jesus, they thought he was another human being. He was bringing God's love there too. That moment of acceptance helped mend their brokenness. And they were instantly transformed by that experience. Acceptance is so crucial in our relationships. We make mistakes, and what happens when we make mistakes? When people around us make mistakes, do we criticize them and judge them and tease them and have some banter about that? Or do we just say, you know what? I love you anyway, and I always will. Because that's what God says to us when we make mistakes. I remember when one of our sons, who was a footballer, he was a goalie, and the inevitable happens that there's going to be a game when you're the goalkeeper and you let all the goals in, and the other team wins, and everybody hates you and your coach has a rant at you, and you come home broken, and you're a teenager, and you're trying not to cry, and mum and dad don't say, well, you should have practiced harder. You should have gone to more uh, matches. You should have gone running every day. They just say, you know what? We love you anyway, and nothing that you do or don't do will ever stop us loving you. Accept one another. How? as Christ has accepted you. So when we understand how much Christ has accepted us in our brokenness, then we can pass that on to others. Another way we mend with gold is through forgiveness. We are accepted by God and he says, I accept you, come, let me forgive you. Let me forgive you. He mends us with his forgiveness even when we have intentionally broken his wise and loving commands. And he reaches out to people who are utterly broken. There's a story of Jesus and a desperate young paralytic. His body was broken, his mind was broken, his heart was broken, but most of all, his soul was broken. And we know that that was so because Jesus doesn't say, be healed. He says, your sins are forgiven. And when he knew he was forgiven, that healed him. That was the goal that he needed to heal his mind, his heart, his soul, his whole body, and his life. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving others as Christ has forgiven you. When we experienced his forgiveness for us, when we truly focus on that and see how much he is forgiving us every day, that can inspire us in the sometimes challenging process of forgiving others and mending our relationships, the ones that are safe and good to mend with the gold of God's forgiveness. It's not always easy to forgive. Sometimes our teacup seems so broken, we think, I'll just put it all in the bin and get a new teacup. But when we can mend, when we can put the pieces together with the love and forgiveness of God, we can begin to heal and mend. God also heals us with his comfort. When we are sad, we can go to him and he will wipe away all our tears. When our heart is breaking, he can mend us. And he calls us to mourn with those who mourn. When people are sad, when life has been tragic, to come alongside them, as it read, as we read in the scripture reading, and be sad with them. It doesn't always mean having lots of tears and tissues. It can mean just being there with them, listening to them, maybe going for a walk with them, maybe taking them somewhere nice. I once asked one of my children, what do I do that comforts you when you've had a bad day so I know what to do again? And they said, well... Comfort for me is making a big mug of hot chocolate and putting squirt of cream all over the top and marshmallows and chocolate sprinkles and a chocolate flake. That's comfort. Good to know these things. Sometimes you should just ask this more often. So if someone near you is sad, had a bad day, whatever, just say, what can I do? What can I do to show you how much I care? What can I do that would help you feel better? And then just do it. Another part of the alloy is God's kindness. He is incredibly kind to us, even though we don't deserve it. And even though most of the time we don't even notice how kind he is being to us. 
He is absolutely showering us with gifts every single day. We are, he's just so kind. And therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be kind. Kindness is one of the best ways to mend broken relationships. Do you know when we're kind to each other, we have less arguments. If you argue with someone a lot, just try being kind, even if you don't feel like it, even if they don't pretend to notice for a while. Just be kind. It is absolutely transformative. I met someone once who was incredibly kind. He was a great leader. He, could, he was leading all kinds of people, doing incredible work to, um, to heal broken lives. And I said to him, what do you most want to be remembered for out of all you have done? And he said, I want to be remembered for being kind. That is the most important thing. And I said, well, how do you do that every day? And he said, well, in every situation, I ask myself, how can I be kind? And then I say, how can I be even kinder? And then that's what I do. How can we be kind and how can we be even kinder? I wonder, instead of looking at the perfect family, we should look for the family that has done the most beautiful job of mending with gold. And actually, when you look at the Bible, there is a story of a family that mended beautifully with gold. It was a very badly broken family, the one with the prodigal son and the welcoming father. We don't know if there was a mother, maybe she was dead, maybe the father was a single parent struggling to do his best. What we do know is the youngest son was disrespectful, inconsiderate, and a selfish rebel. He forced his dad to sell all the business so that he could take his share and run away with it. <coughs> then he completely squandered it till there was nothing left and he was completely penniless. And then he had to go and live with the pigs, the animals he had despised all of his life. And he was so hungry, he was wiping the dust off the corn husks and, uh, husks and just chewing them for breakfast and lunch. But there was something in his memory, a memory of the best father ever, his dad. His dad, who would love everybody no matter what, the little boy who would look after the sheep and was naughty sometimes, the old man who was now past his usefulness, but we still kept, they still kept him on the estate. His father would always make sure they were fed, they were clothed, they had a place to stay. And maybe he thought, my dad is so good, maybe, maybe the only place I have to go is back home. And so he went back home completely broken. His spirit was broken, his body was broken, his emotions were broken, his life was broken. And he had no idea what would he would ex encounter. And then when he meets his dad, when his dad sees him for the very first time, he mends him with gold. The very first thing he does is let him know without a shadow of a doubt he is accepted and he is welcomed. And he runs towards him to mend that relationship with gold. And then he throws his arms around him and gives him a big hug. He comforts him gives him love, gives him kindness, gives him forgiveness. He knows he is forgiven. And this father is mending all of his broken pieces with his loving, accepting, comforting kindness. And then he puts a ring on his finger, a gold ring, to mend perfectly with love. Because this ring symbolizes you are part of my family. You will always be with us. You are, um, you are loved. You are home. And he mends that relationship with love. And that's what God calls us to do. He needs us to work with him to mend the broken relationships around us. We need to work with him. We need to bring him the pieces. We need to ask for his help when it's difficult to accept those that have hurt us, to comfort those who are sad, to forgive those who have hurt us, and to be kind and to heal and bring love. We need to bring all these things together by experiencing all of that that God gives to us and then using that alloy to mend the brokenness in our lives and the brokenness in our relationships. I know it's tough. In my work as a family therapist, I saw many families who had such brokenness that I thought they will never find a way through this. But when they patiently did and put their pieces together with love, with forgiveness and comfort and all these wonderful other things, they healed something. And what they made then was most beautiful. And actually, the more broken they were, the more gold was in those cracks and the more precious the relationships came. And you know, the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son and the father, he is the best father ever. And the most amazing thing is that he is our father, all of our father. We are all part of his family. We all have access to this incredible richness of the gold of his love. Actually, I've just been handed another envelope here. 
uh, must be a last minute uh, nomination. And the outside it says the best family ever award. And I wonder what it says. Bit of a drum roll here. Let's open this and go da 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 da. The winner is the family of God. So this award is actually for all of us because we are all in God's family. He is the best father and mother ever. And it's not about us being perfect or even being the perfect family. It's about us being willing to pick up the pieces with him and to use the gold of his love and work with him to mend the broken places in our lives so that we can become people who are kintsugi artists with God, mending the brokenness in our families, in our world, in our community. So congratulations, everyone. This award is for you. Now go from here and create kintsugi. Mm -hmm.